Well, that m- music, that music means that it's time for the money hour. And if it's time for the money hour, then it's time for me to get off my uh, rear end here and get going. This is Harry Brown, and it will be for the next hour my pleasure to talk with you about money, the economy, your investments, your savings, anything having to do with such topics. And you're invited to call with questions, to make comments, uh, to collect a bill, whatever it is you uh, have and need, just give me a call at 1-800-259-9231. Or, if you prefer, it may be easier for you to just send me an email. The address is question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org or call me at 1-800-259-9231. I thought today we might uh, get started by my just giving you some quotations about money and investments from people that have said some very sage things over the years that we should take to heart. For example, Richard Russell in 1987 said, One of the most difficult concepts to grasp is that a prominent person who speaks with seemingly total authority can at any time be totally wrong. That realization has saved me a lot of money over the years. That's Richard Russell of Dow Theory Letters said that in 1987 in his newsletter. Another quote from Russell about the same time, Anybody can be dead wrong about the economy and the stock market. The Fed chairman, Boone Pickens, Dr. Henry Kaufman, Donald Trump, absolutely anybody can be wrong. And uh, there was a fellow that I knew named Stu Sanders who wrote this little limerick. There once was a man named of Bryce who helped me with stocks for a price. Now he's got the dough and lives in Bordeaux, and I flip a coin for advice. That was Stu Sanders. And a fellow named Robert Reno, who's a Newsday columnist, or once was a Newsday columnist, Robert Reno said, Why can't we just settle for the simple, provable fact that virtually all bull markets in the last hundred years have ended unpleasantly? It's as inevitable as the truth that if you don't take a bath, you will eventually smell. And uh, Charlotte Coles Goldston said in the Nashville Banner back in 1997, according to a Liberty Financial-sponsored Harris poll, 85% of mutual fund shareholders expect stocks to return at least 15% annually during the next 10 years. Now, that was said in 1997 that the poll revealed that these mutual fund hold shareholders expected stocks to return at least 15% annually. Of course, three years later, the stock market tanked and went down for three years, so I doubt that people over the last seven years have got a return of 15% annually. But the quotation is valuable because it reminds us that our expectations are exactly that, expectations, not realizations. Henry Hazlitt, in Economics in One Lesson, said what was probably the most important statement ever made about economics. He said, The art of economics consists of looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. That was Henry Hazlitt in Economics in One Lesson, a very, very good book that you can get at Amazon. Now, there's several things about that that I'd like to call attention to, several things about what he said. First of all, notice he said the art of economics, not the science of economics. Economics is what we call a social science, like psychology or uh, sociology, uh, the various ones that deal with human action and the human minds. Ludwig von Mises called the science of human action praxeology, and it embraced all of these different social sciences. 
they are completely different from the natural sciences, which are things like physics and chemistry and so on. Physics, chemistry, and other natural sciences deal with inanimate objects that never change their character and are the same one to another. Every proton is the same, and every proton remains the same, so that you can conduct experiments. And if the protons act in a certain way given a certain environment, then you know in the future they will act the same way given the same environment. The social sciences are different because they deal in human action. And human minds are different one from another. My mind is not the same as yours. Yours is not the same as your spouse's, and so on down the line. Not only that, but my mind is going to change over the next week, over the next year, over the next few years. So will yours, so will your spouse's, so will your spouse's best friend. And the point is that you cannot conduct controlled, controlled experiments in economics because whatever you find is not necessarily going to be true the next time these circumstances appear to be the same, even if you're dealing with the same people, because those people will have changed in the future. So economics is not a science in the sense that we think of physics or chemistry. So Henry Hazlitt refers to the art of economics, meaning that this is something that some people have a talent for. It's like the art of playing the piano. You know, I have had a lot of piano lessons in my life, and it was only a few years ago that it suddenly dawned on me. I have no talent for playing the piano. Yes, I can sit down and play a few tunes, and I can do a few things on the piano, but I could practice the rest of my life, and I would never be good enough to get a job in a cocktail lounge playing the piano, let alone appearing on the stage with the New York Philharmonic, or being in a famous pop band of any kind. I don't have that talent. I don't have that art. And it's very few people who really have the art that Henry Aslett is talking about. Now, when he says that it consists of looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any policy, he's talking about people who think, well, the government will do this and it will provide immediate relief for these people or immediate benefits, whatever, but you have to also look at the long-term consequences. How will this change people's actions in the future, knowing that this government program exists? They will not act the same way that they did before the program existed. And you have to look at those longer-term effects. He also says that it consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. It isn't enough to say, look at how these people were benefited by this government program. Look at how students have been benefited by student loans. Well, we have to look at the other groups, the groups that paid for it. We have to look at the groups that now can't go to college because it's too expensive. We have to look at the longer-range consequences, the fact that the more subsidies that are given to colleges, the more colleges raise their prices, knowing that the students can afford it with these student loans and other government aid. So the art of economics consists of looking not at just the short-term effects and not just the effects for one group. All right, the music means we have to take our first break, but when we come back, we'll look at some more of these pithy statements that people have made that can help us understand what we can do and what we can't do with our investments. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, 
Here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Failsafe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Money Talk, and this is Harry Brown, and uh, this as, that is you out there listening, isn't it? And we are going through some pithy statements that have been made by people over the years about money and investments and looking at the insight that they can provide. Before we took the break, I talked about Henry Hazlitt and the difference between natural sciences and social sciences, social sciences dealing with human action, and the fact that experiments are not replicable, not repeatable in the social sciences the way they are in the natural sciences. In the natural sciences, scientists will conduct an experiment a dozen, 50, 100 times over to make sure that they have it correct and that it does work the same way every time. Then they will publish their findings and other scientists will replicate the results. And if they can do so, then this will be accepted as a cause and effect relationship. You can't do that in the social sciences because you can't herd the same people into the same laboratory with the same amount of information and with the same desires that they had when you conducted the first test. Now, as a result of that, Milton Friedman, whom you've probably heard of, the famous uh, conservative libertarian economist, said way, way back in his book, Essays in Positive Economics, in 1953, he said, factual evidence can never prove a hypothesis. It can only fail to disprove it, which is what we generally mean when we say somewhat inexactly, that the hypothesis has been confirmed by experience. Now, here's what that means. Somebody shows you a graph of an investment price, uh, the gold price, or whatever it may be, and shows you that every time that such and such has happened, gold has gone up, or gold has gone down, or whatever it is, that this has happened four or five times, too often to be coincidence. But what Friedman is saying is that this doesn't prove anything. The only reason you do these things, that you check these things out, that you print out these graphs, and that you look at this information and so on, is to see if a particular hypothesis has already been disproved. All that graph that shows this cause and effect relationship happening three or four times, all that graph can tell you is that it has happened three or four times and that it might happen again as a result. But in fact, with human action, the more times it happens, the more likely it is it isn't going to happen the next time because people will have adjusted to the fact that this happens and their adjustment means that it won't happen in the future. But we do look at these things just to see if history has already disproved a particular hypothesis. If you think that every time the Federal Reserve raises the discount rate, it's bad for the stock market, you look back to see if that idea has ever been disproven by history. And if it has, you just simply throw it away. And let's take one more quote with, regarding the difference between the natural and social sciences. Frederick von Hayek, the Nobel Prize winner and uh, what you might call a libertarian economist, he was one of the Austrian economists, said way back in 1952, there are no better terms available to describe the difference between the approach of the natural and the social sciences than to call the former the natural sciences, in other words, objective, and the latter, the social sciences, subjective. While for the natural scientist, the contrast between objective facts and subjective opinions is a simple one, the distinction cannot be as readily applied to the object of the social sciences. The reason for this is that the object, the facts of the social sciences, are also opinions. In other words, we are looking at what people think 
rather than what people do. Not opinions of the student of the social phenomena, of course, but opinion of those whose actions produce the object of the social scientist. In other words, we're dealing with shifting opinions and not uh, repeatable facts that are going to happen over and over and over again. All right, now with regard to the predictions people make about the way things are going and new waves of the future and in the future such and such, and you hear these kind of predictions all the time. Well, John Judas of the New Republic said back in 1997, In 1969, government and academic economists, flush with a decade of unbroken economic expansion, held a conference titled, Is the Business Cycle Obsolete? And let me interject that the business cycle is the waves of recession and inflation and good times and bad times that seem to just keep recurring over and over again, one alternating with the other. And to go on with the quote, that year, MIT economist and former Kennedy advisor Paul Samuelson remarked that the Bureau, National, National Bureau of Economic Research had worked itself out of one of its first jobs, which is tracking the business cycle, now that there were no longer business cycles. And Judas goes on to say, two years later, The economy had begun to turn down, and by 1974, it had plunged into the worst recession since the 1930s. Now, almost three decades passed, with the economy entering the seventh year of recovery and the Dow soaring over 7,000. Politicians and economists are again touting the end of the business cycle. Yes, we can get carried away on waves of optimism or pessimism, but... Nothing goes on forever. All right, let's uh, go to another subject. Robert Reno of Newsday, again. He said, one thing that hasn't changed in a hundred years is that the crowd of people pretending to make a science of knowing what the market will do, many of them at great profit, always exceed those on Wall Street who will honestly concede that stock prices often go up and down for reasons that are less readily understood than a chicken's decision to cross the road. That was Robert Reno of Newsday back in 1997. And what he's saying is very important. You know, you read in the newspaper, or you see on the Internet, or you hear on television, stocks went up today on the news that such and such. And you can't help but believe that this is some kind of an objective fact that the reason stocks went up today was because of this particular event that the reporter cites. What you don't know is that whoever is writing this material will write that the stock market went up today. And his editor will say, wait a minute, you've got to insert a reason for this. You have to tell people why the stock market went up. So the reporter will get on the phone and he'll call somebody on Wall Street, somebody he knows in a brokerage office or wherever, and say, why did stocks go up? And the person that he calls will say, well, I think it's because such and such. And the reporter will accept that as an objective fact and read it as such on the air or put it in his article about the stock market in the next day's newspaper, when in fact the person that he called has no more idea of why stocks went up that day than why a chicken crosses the road. We'll come back and I'll discuss the importance of that realization after these words. So don't go away. This is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. All right, Harry Brown here, and I thank you for tuning in today. If you have a question, call 1-800-259-9231. And if you're too shy to call, then just uh, send an email, question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org or call 1-800-259-9231. Now, before we went to the break, I was saying that what you read in the paper or hear in, on television as to why the stock market went up or down yesterday or any given day is no more factual and no more objective than, as Robert Reno said, knowing why the chicken decided to cross the road. Uh, reporters just simply latch on to any theory that anybody will give them from somebody in Wall Street when, in fact, uh, the stock market is not mysterious per se, but it is mysterious in practice in that so many people's decisions went into whatever the stock market did yesterday or whatever the gold price did yesterday or the price of wheat or whatever that we don't have access to that, all that data, all that information, and no does, neither does anybody on Wall Street. And so they are simply guessing at what caused the price to move by a certain amount yesterday, last week, last year, whatever. Now, there are certain events that are so obvious that we can pretty much attribute what has happened to those events. For instance, uh, if suddenly on Monday morning out of a clear blue sky, President Bush said, we're invading Iran tonight. Uh, we're not uh, putting up with this uh, stuff in Iraq anymore. They're getting too much help from Iran. So I've ordered the troops to invade Iran and bombing is beginning and so forth and so on. It would catch everybody by such surprise that if the market then went down 100 points or went up 100 points, you would have to say that it was President Bush's announcement that had pretty much to do with it. But the only times that you can actually glean some cause and effect relationship is when the situation is so exceptional that it's not likely to happen again the next day or the next week. So knowing that that caused this to happen is of little help to you in the future. Most of the time you have no idea why the market moves, so you can't use that information in any profitable way. All right, we have a question from Bob out in cyberspace who says, given that the U.S. money supply has increased exponentially over the past five years or so, isn't it a fact that the government has already made each dollar worth less? I subscribe to your permanent portfolio concept of having 25% each in bonds, gold, stocks, and cash. But can't we operate under the premise that each dollar will be worth less in the future? That seems like it is a scientific and provable fact. Well, it's not a scientific and provable fact that each dollar will be worth less in the future. It is, however, a very, very, very great likelihood. But the information is almost totally worthless. Even if we accept it as a provable scientific fact that the dollar will continue to deteriorate in purchasing power over the future, over the next 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, it is not worth a dime to us in terms of investing. Why? Because the dollar has been deteriorating in exactly the same way, not, over, not just over the last 5 years, but over the last 90 years with just very few exceptions. Ever since the Federal Reserve took over the production of the money supply in this country, the dollar has been deteriorating. And as a result, it is worth now about one-tenth what it was, one-tenth in purchasing power, what it was 
when the Federal Reserve took over in 1913. There are exceptions. During the 1920s, the dollar regained some of its value, and it regained some of its value during the early 1930s when there was a gigantic deflation in this country and each dollar became worth more. But then from 1933 onward, the dollar continued its downward spiral in purchasing power. And then there was a brief period in the 50s when in one year the dollar might go up slightly in value and the next year go down slightly in value. In other words, it was pretty much holding its own. So my point is that just that we now have discovered that the dollar might go is probably going to go down in value over the next five or ten years doesn't really tell us anything, just as it didn't tell us anything five years ago or ten years ago. If you had asked me in 1985, is the dollar likely to go down in value? In other words, is inflation likely to continue at, at some rate? I would have to say yes but it would not have told me what was going to happen in the stock market or even the gold market because the fact that the dollar did deteriorate during the 80s and the 90s did not help gold at all. It was only in the last few years that gold has finally begun to move up. But because of that downward drop in the value of the dollar, people have been predicting an imminent rise in gold for the last 25 years a rise that has not taken place. So, sometimes we discover things that seem to be so, but are of no concrete profitable value. Milton Friedman, again, referring to the Federal Reserve System and a very, very common uh, misconception about the Federal Reserve System, Milton Friedman said, the Federal Reserve cannot and does not control interest rates. If the Fed could control interest rates, does anyone really believe that we would have seen the prime rate at 20% in 1981? End of quote. It's a very, very telling observation by Milton Friedman. The Fed doesn't have the ability to control interest rates. It can influence interest rates. It can make them lower than they would be otherwise. It can make them higher than they would be otherwise. But it can't make the interest rate be what it wants it to be because obviously the Federal Reserve did not want the interest rate to be 20% in 1981, and yet it was despite them. Now, an area that I, of course, think is very important is forecasting because I don't believe that anybody can profitably and predictably and reliably forecast the future. So here are a few quotes on that subject. Chet Courier, an Associated Press columnist, said in 1998, Suspend immediately all efforts to guess when stock or bond prices might top out. You can't predict market declines, and once they have started, you have no better shot at figuring out how long they will last or how far down they will go. And Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian economist, said if it were possible to calculate the future structure of the market, the future would not be uncertain. There would be no opportunity for loss or profit because the future would be known to everybody. And I have a really good one from Dilbert, of all people. You know, Dilbert, the cartoon character, made an excellent insight into forecasting. And I'll give you that when we come back. This is Harry Brown. Well, welcome back. Harry Brown here, and we have still have two segments left, so if you want to call, it's 1-800-259-9231. If you want to send me an email, it's question at harrybrown.org. And I promised you a quote from Dilbert, so I'll give you that before we take the next email question that came in. And Scott Adams, has, who is the author of the Dilbert comic strip, has written a bit about the future, about uh, the economy, about uh, investing, about forecasting, and so forth. And he said, 
There are many methods for predicting the future. You can read horoscopes, tea leaves, tarot cards, and crystal balls, what we might call the nutty method. Or you can put well-researched facts into sophisticated computer models, what we might refer to as a complete waste of time. And I really think this is a valuable quote because we tend to be awed by these computer models and these people who do all this work to take all the data from the last hundred years and put it into a computer and print out graphs and uh, determine cause and effect relationships and therefore be able to tell you that when this cause happens, the following effect is bound to ensue. When, in fact, these things just don't work out as expected, and as Scott Adams says, they're in a large measure a complete waste of time. Now, the study of economics is not a waste of time. It can help you a great deal. It has certainly helped me. I have been studying economics for, I guess I would say, roughly about 45 years, and it certainly has helped me in my personal life. It has helped me in my investment life. It has helped me in my business life because it gives you a better understanding of how people act, of uh, what is likely to happen, uh, what is perhaps even more important is that it lets you know what can't happen. There have been so many times I've been involved in a business situation and somebody has come up with some kind of plan that, boy, this is going to get us all kinds of, of new customers and so forth. And because of my economic training, I can see that this is a complete worthless idea. And so it has saved me great gobs of money in business and other activities by showing me what not to do sometimes. So I want you to understand that I don't think that the study of economics is worthless. I think it's very valuable. But just don't expect it to do for you what other people expect it to do, which is give you an insight into the future. All right. Scott out in Chicago says uh, in an email, what are the likely consequences to the American economy and American freedoms when the government's more than $50 trillion in unfunded liabilities begin coming due? We know that the current borrowing and spending and promising will eventually lead to a crisis. We don't know when, of course, but when it hits, will we get inflation, a deflationary depression, asset confiscation, and socialism? What are we going to get? Well, Scott, I would say all of the above are possibilities. We don't know how it will play out. Because, for example, if the government said, this is a crisis, we're facing up to the crisis, and the only way we know to solve this crisis is to take more money away from you, and they tax us heavily to pay off some of these liabilities, some of these promises that they have made for which they put no money away in reserve to be able to pay and make good on these promises when the promises came due. So they tax us tax us maybe double the tax rates so that the highest rate is 70% uh, or 80% or even 90% as it was during World War II. They say this is a crisis every bit as critical as World War II was. Therefore, we see nothing wrong with putting a 91% tax rate on. Well, the result of that would be a depression, a really bad depression just as we underwent a really bad depression during World War II. People talk about World War II stimulating the economy. Yeah, it stimulated General Motors creating more tanks. It stimulated arms manufacturers creating more rifles and bullets and so forth. But it certainly didn't do anything for the refrigerator industry or the tire industry or the general automotive industry or... Uh, so many other industries which no longer could sell to consumers. And it certainly didn't do anything for the consumer who might be making more money than he ever made before now that he was working in a defense plant, but he couldn't spend it on anything that he wanted uh, because those things were not available. You couldn't get butter. Uh, You couldn't get meat uh, except with ration coupons and things of this sort. 
So the country went through a depression, and that might happen if they decide to handle these unfunded liabilities with, a de- uh, with taxation. They might do it through inflation, um, through just simply printing the money, in which case the result would be inflation. They might do it, as uh, Scott suggests, through asset confiscation and socialism and uh, various new kinds of rules and so on, just absolutely taking things away other than money from people. There are all kinds of possibilities. We don't know how they will handle it. We don't know how it will unfold. Scott has a second question, which we'll take up when we come back from the break. This is Harry Brown. So glad you're listening today. Please stay tuned because we have another segment left. This is Harry Brown. You've worked too hard for your savings to risk them on somebody's grand plan to double them. Wouldn't you rather have a safe, secure portfolio, one that grows steadily each year without the wide swings in the investment markets? For 25 years, I've shown people how to have such a portfolio, one that made money the past few years rather than losing heavily. Now you can get that same help from my book, Fail Safe Investing. You can have that secure, bulletproof portfolio. You can download Fail Safe Investing at libertyfree.com for only $9.75. Then read it on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. The book can give you the security you crave without becoming a speculator or a market whiz. Go to libertyfree.com to read a sample chapter and then start protecting your savings. Fail Safe Investing can be yours tonight at libertyfree.com. Well, with that happy music, we can proceed into the next week knowing that we are able to take care of ourselves because nobody else is going to do it for us. And I think the best way to take care of yourself is by having the money you can't afford to lose, whether that's $1,000 or $10 million, in a balanced portfolio that will protect you whatever may come, a balanced, diversified portfolio. And what I like is 25% in gold, 25% in bonds, 25% in stocks, and 25% in cash. That's a four-way split between stocks, bonds, gold, and cash. And Scott, in his question, says, the second part of his question is, if you know that the government can't make good on all its promises, then at what point would you decide it's time to get out of bonds? I don't believe there's any point, Scott because we don't know how it's going to unfold, and one of the ways it might unfold is through heavy taxation, and it's a very likely possibility, which in itself could go two ways. Number one is it might increase the need for people to borrow money because so much is being taken away by the government, which would cause interest rates to go up because of the demand for money, and it would be bad for bonds. Or... People may decide that they are so squeezed by taxation that they can't afford to buy a new car, which they would normally buy by putting a certain amount of money down or trading in their old car and then borrowing the rest of the money. Or they might uh, say that they're not going to buy a new house, they're going to continue to rent because they are afraid that they will not be able to afford the mortgage payments and so on. And so the increase in taxation could cause borrowing to shrink. It could go either way. And if borrowing shrunk, then, of course, uh, interest rates would go down and bonds would be the one thing that would be saving you under such circumstances. If interest rates went way up and we had inflation as a result of it, then it would be gold that would save you. The point is you don't know what it is that you're going to need, and that's why you keep them. In 19, keep all four of these things. In 1980, after 10 years of rising interest rates, which were bad for bonds, I couldn't convince anybody to put money into bonds. Well, I shouldn't say I couldn't convince anybody, but a lot of people said, I absolutely think you're nuts 
to put bonds in the portfolio. They are guaranteed to go down in value. But over the next 10 years of the 1980s, they went up in value. And they helped to keep the portfolio going well when cash and gold were not doing well and stocks were doing reasonably well but were uncertain, going up for a while, then down for a while, and so forth. So you never know. That's why you need a balanced portfolio. And with that, you can look at the future brightly, just as brightly as this music that's playing now, that's saying it's time to go. But I sure appreciate your tuning in today. This is Harry Brown. Come back next week. Papa.